Hi, and welcome to another session of the 2020 GovHack virtual conference. We are a festival of ideas using open government data to make our communities better places. GovHack is an international competition for people of all abilities who seek to make life better through open data. In a couple of weeks, on the weekend of the 14th to the 16th of August, thousands will come together in what has become one of the world's largest data open data competitions. We hope to deliver an interactive experience through the YouTube. So if you are viewing the embedded video on our hackerspace, click on either the video title or the YouTube logo to open the video in a new tab and join the conversation on chat. This session tonight is proudly supported by Infosys. Infosys are the lead corporate international sponsor of GovHacking 2020. They've been sponsoring GovHack for several years now, and we really, truly appreciate their support. The title of this session is Conversations with Infosys and Monash University, Artificial Intelligence for Law Enforcement and Community Safety. I'd like to welcome Eden Fernandez. Eden is from the Infosys marketing team and will open the discussion and introduce the speakers for this evening. Thank you, Eden. Thank you very much, Sue Ellen. Uh, and again, a very warm welcome to all of you on behalf of uh, Infosys and uh, Monash University. Uh, so as Sue mentioned, uh, today's session is going to be based on artificial intelligence for law enforcement and uh, community safety. Uh, and of course, in, in partnership with uh, Monash University and, and the Alex Lab, uh, we have the team from Monash joining us as well. Um, so just to kind of give you all a br brief uh, introduction, uh, about emphasis and how we kind of involved in this whole uh, engagement. So emphasis, uh, as some of you might know, is a global uh, digital uh, transformation partner for companies across the world. Uh, and of course, in Australia as well. So we've been in the region for over uh, 20 years now. And the whole, um, you know, and we've been kind of closely associated with GovAC, trying to help nurture uh, the next generation of, of talent, uh, you know, and technology skills and, uh, and, and, you know, kind of just nurture that talent. Um, and that's one of the reasons we kind of closely associate and work uh, with GovHack through mentoring and having some really cool challenges uh, over the years. Um, so today's uh, session is going to give you a bit of a glimpse as to what you can expect uh, at GovHack this year uh, from an emphasis standpoint, uh, along with our partners. Um, just to give you a brief today, we have a really, really good uh, uh, esteemed uh, guest uh, panelist uh, from, from Infosys and Monash University. Um, we have Dr. Campbell Wilson, uh, who's co-director of the Alex Lab and Associate Dean International Monash uh, University. Uh, welcome, Campbell. Um, we also have um, Dr. Greg Roland, who's a senior research fellow uh, at the Alex, Alex Lab at Monash University. Um, and we have uh, Ashok uh, Ratnagiri, who's part of the Infosys team and is director and head uh, systems engineering uh, for Edgeware, which is a, a subsidiary of Infosys it's a software product uh, company. So before we um, uh, kind of get into the session, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of get a sense of uh, what you can expect. Uh, so primarily, you know, the whole idea of this session is to give you a sense of how AI can be leveraged uh, for community safety, for law enforcement, uh, and also explore some of the nuances with it when it comes to community safety. You know, what is the ethics uh, behind this the explain, explainability uh, of artificial intelligence is a big uh, kind of a question for the technology community today. So uh, we, we really want you to think on those lines as to what, uh, you know, how can you kind of approach uh, AI in today's context? Uh, and we'll kind of uncover that through this session. And we really, really want you to engage uh, as much as possible, ask us questions. The whole idea is to make this a stimulating discussion between the panelists uh, and, you know, the participants. Uh, so we'll begin with um, uh, Ashok from from uh, who's part of the emphasis team and joining us. Uh, Ashok, you've been part of the industry for you know many years now, uh, and I guess uh, you know you would have a unique perspective as to how you know industry has evolved in terms of applications of AI, uh, and also I mean as a practitioner uh, in the space, you know we'd really kind of keen to understand your point of view, uh, and then maybe some of the thoughts that you want to leave. Uh, the speakers with, I mean, the participants with. Uh, over to you, Ashok. Thank you, Eden. Thank you so much. Um, I'm uh, very happy to be here amongst all uh, the, the enthusiastic participants of the GovHack. 
um, I will first start with artificial intelligence uh, uh, across the industry. Um, uh, something like um, you know how it is being used, and uh, you know what are the statistics around it? How mature is AI today to be used in the industry, etc. Uh, let me just uh, share a slide uh, which will uh, uh, provide some insight into that. Yeah, so if you look at the current situation of the consumption of AI in the industry, uh, you'll find that uh, there are a lot of organizations uh, which are experimenting with it. If you think that uh, AI is uh, still niche in the research centers, in the universities, and uh, being just tinkered with for future use, uh, you may be wrong because many of the industry players today are already doing uh, quite a bit with, uh, with, with AI, how the algorithms can be used to improve their uh, staff productivity, to solve some of the very complex business problems, uh, how to make them uh, more profitable, and how to actually navigate through uh, the the various uncertainties in the market. You know, there are some unprecedented times that uh, we are seeing today. So, how do AI? How does AI help uh, solve some of these issues? Uh, however, you know, the point that we need to note is in the industry today many of these organizations which are doing quite a bit uh, yeah. uh, amount of work in uh, the ai space are not able to move from uh, experimentation to production there are uh, some valid reasons for it it's not about the capability of ai itself nor the uh, amount of uh, trials and uh, uh, you know the the applicability of AI algorithms, the efficiency of algorithms. See, these are just one part of the story. But more importantly, there is something more that the industry needs. Uh, if I were to make a model which will identify uh, any suspicious character by analyzing, uh, say, a video feed from a CCTV camera or any other security camera in a in a place like an airport or a public place like a shopping mall, etc. Uh, I would uh, uh, do it pretty precisely within uh, the lab environment. But if, uh, just imagine a situation where a particular uh, person is flagged off as a suspicious character uh, using the video feed, and if it has to be presented in a court of law for uh, consumption as an evidence, so does AI provide enough uh, uh, of the uh, data points uh, which will uh, in which will conclusively prove that uh, it can be relied upon the algorithm can be relied upon right so what are the exceptions uh, that uh, ai can throw so see the, the the point that i'm trying to make here is that while the algorithms may be efficient while the data sets are there which will help us achieve a certain amount of prediction accuracy uh, the 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 point about how do we make the model accountable? How do we explain the decision taken by an AI system, right? So that is going to be very, very crucial. So that is where industry is uh, struggling today to uh, uh, actually move the AI models that work perfectly fine otherwise into a production environment. Yeah, so the reasons, as I just mentioned, they're not so easily auditable. The, the, the predictions are not very easily explainable. Uh, and, and even if uh, we make the model explain itself, uh, it is uh, very difficult to provide it in a human readable uh, format. Uh, so, so these are some of the very important reasons uh, that, uh, that, that today are deterring the AI to move for, further. But uh, it's not something that we can uh, just sit back on, right? Because there is a huge opportunity there is a, a 15.7 trillion economic impact that is expected in, in about a decade from now uh, uh, on the overall global economy. So there are various things uh, uh, that happen, you know, in, uh, all around us, within the industry, within the corporate, within the enterprise, and also within our social lives, which uh, uh, actually can be touched by AI. Already we see that so many uh, areas of impact 
uh, where where the consequences are uh, not so serious there there are there is a lot of ai which is already applied right so uh, but but i think it will only proliferate you 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 just cannot close your eyes uh, to say that the ai has these kind of problems so we cannot use it in so and so areas etc and today we are talking uh, we are going to talk about how do we use ai in uh, community safety and law enforcement uh, etc we have we have uh, very good experts on the panel you will hear uh, some very interesting stuff uh, that's going on in that area but then uh, there are there are these challenges to be solved before we can uh, confidently say that ai can now be consumed in uh, these areas uh, which are of critical importance for for a social well being these challenges uh, of course the any uh, ai or a machine learning problem the first uh, issue starts with the availability of data uh, how clean the data is etc so the data cleansing and how to remove bias uh, from the data sets it remains a challenge and how do we make the results reproducible uh, you know given that ai systems work on fuzzy uh, kind of a logic uh, they are not deterministic uh, so in in the, in in uh, indeterministic systems how do you make the model uh, do the same thing in a repeatable way again and again so that's one very critical thing if uh, Uh, a, the output of an ai model has to be uh, allowed or, or permissible in a court of law right then uh, we also have to have uh, certain checkpoints uh, which will make the models feel accountable for their uh, uh, actions so today we see that uh, more and more uh, systems are employing uh, bots we we consistently hear of robotic process automation etc so when these uh, machines or the bots are doing the actions how do we know that uh, somebody has not manipulated the bots to do in an action in a certain way right so for every action that happens every decision that a bot takes can we make it more accountable for the action or decision that it is taking right so that is a very important aspect uh, that is uh, again there to solve for all of us the other important uh, aspect that i want to highlight here is uh, is uh, that say i have tried to capture these points which are relevant for any kind of in industry right and um, we we will see as we go further into the session how it is more so with the, the area of uh, community safety and law enforcement because these uh, Uh, particular points these these challenges that we have to overcome get magnified in the context of uh, law enforcement and community safety but whatever be the specific problem that you pick to solve in as a part of the gov hack uh, i would urge you all to consider these points uh, to be to be in mind when you come out with your final solution your idea your hack is going to be pushed into production or it will remain an academic project so it's very important that you consider these points that i just made then going ahead uh, yeah i'll just leave uh, the uh, session uh, with some of these questions that i just said you need to consider uh, when you are Uh, uh embarking on this uh, journey of trying to find a solution to some of the uh, basic uh, needs of a of a human community right so when you are trying to solve a problem uh, of how to use ai in community safety to improve our the standard of our lives to reduce the crime rate in our society to detect early any kind of uh, 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 non standard behavior right uh, unpredictable behavior so when you are uh, having to uh, solve such a problem uh, one very important aspect uh, to bear in mind is that uh, whatever involves human behavior right so i'm sure uh, the the uh, human resource professionals will agree with me that whenever there is a human behavior that is involved then the entire problem statement intrinsically becomes uh, very complex so that is uh, so when we are talking about community law, community safety this is something which you will have to absolutely bear in mind 
then uh, yeah there are a couple of other uh, things that you 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 can find solutions for for example how to make reliable data sets so how do you ensure that a data a data set that we are picking up for uh, uh, finding a solution in community safety uh, by itself is not carrying some kind of a bias right so how do you know that address the privacy issues because if you have to use a, a data set and especially in the area like a com com community safety you are bound to use uh, data that is uh, related to certain humans certain citizens of the country and uh, how do you overcome the privacy issues with that then how do you also uh, prevent uh, data set tampering this is actually my favorite subject uh, i've written a couple of um, articles on this on how to avoid uh, injection of any kind of a wanton bias in the data set. So the data sets that you use for training your model, how do you ensure that those data sets uh, you know, are not tweaked to uh, make the AI model behave in a certain predictable way, in a, in a way in which it, it shows biased results rather than neutral results. So how do you ensure that the accesses are controlled properly, right? How do you ensure that the data, uh, the perturbations are not introduced in the data, which will cause uh, you know, the, the behavior of the model in an unpredictable way, right? And then what are those considerations that you should bear in mind to make a model's prediction a permissible evidence in a court of law? Uh, is it reproducible? Is there an audit log that comes along with the uh, way the a, a certain neural network has functioned? Can you put uh, the, the series of weights at each layer of the neural network, uh, which will probably finally uh, help us arrive at how the deep learning uh, model has uh, made this decision, has arrived at this decision, right? So that is another very important consideration. And then, yeah, ultimately, you know, if there is a judge in the court of law, What is that you will make to make a judge trust a data scientist or an AI engineer more than a human, uh, or at least at par with the human, right? So these are some you know very practical uh, challenges that we need to overcome to have a very uh, you know a pragmatic uh, usage of AI in the community safety. So I just leave you all with these thoughts, and um, uh, uh, you know these, these are as I said you know irrespective of the kind of problem statement that you'll pick in this area of community safety and law enforcement, all of these points are, are certainly uh, important uh, for you uh, to bear in mind, to find uh, answers for. So with this, um, I now uh, leave the panel open for um, Dr. Campbell Wilson to take over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashok. I mean, that's, I think, a very valid uh, kind of considerations that not just for the for the for the audience but also for the panel to I guess uh, you know uh, share their thoughts on um, I guess you know human behavior as we all know is really complex and then when you bring in AI and 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 you know expect AI to be a, a kind of a judge of it and then explain be able to explain the decisions I think it, it becomes really interesting I guess that would be a really good segue for us uh, to our next uh, speaker. Um, in fact, you know, we, we just have Greg kind of uh, uh, pitch in uh, and, and then, you know, get into Campbell's thoughts as well. Um, uh, you know, Greg, uh, uh, Ashok, you know, mentioned a lot around uh, the, the, the data sets and how important, you know, it is to have biased uh, data sets. I guess, you know, love to uncover from you, you know, the importance of, of data in uh, kind of coming together and, and, and explainability of AI and, and you know, how the role that it plays in this whole process. And I guess the overarching uh, theme that all of us uh, are trying to address and, and kind of talk about is, is the ethics of it, right? So I think uh, these are some of the bits, um, you know, we'd love to kind of seek your thoughts. And just a reminder to the audience, uh, you know, please share your thoughts, uh, not just questions, you know, even if you have thoughts that you think, uh, you know, we could take back and, and uh, could, be, could, you know, could be really useful for us because th these are questions that all of us uh, face in a very practical sense, whether it is in the Alex lab at Infosys or, or otherwise. Uh, so over to you, Greg. 
Fine. So, um, first of all, uh, I'm Greg Rowland from uh, the Alex Lab at Monash University. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land upon which I live and work and am presenting for you tonight and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And thanks, Ashok, for setting the scene with, with that and the, letting us get an appreciation of how complex and um, uh, important this, this sort of problem is. Um, Campbell, who's going to follow me, is um, going to talk a little bit more about the lab itself and what, and what we do. And I thought I'd um, speak a little bit about uh, what we see as community safety. Um, uh, people have a fairly good understanding of law enforcement, but, but community safety is actually a fairly broad kind of uh, uh, topic. And so I just thought I'd spend a couple of minutes um, drilling down on this. I might then, you know, answer some of or address some of the things that Eden brought up. Um, and I noticed there's a couple of questions here from some people in the in the chat. Um, and uh, Brett Cooper um, has uh, raised some issues about issues of sexism and racism and problems with facial recognition and, and the like. And I'll try um, uh, and it, you know, cover those in my my chat, but if I don't uh, cover them appropriately, um, please hit us up afterwards in the questions and we can we can talk about that um, in a little bit more detail. So as a shock kind of mentioned, you know, our role here is to think about how we leverage technology and in particular um, artificial intelligence um, type of technologies. And I noticed in the chat too, there's some discussion about whether we should call it machine learning or AI or, or whatever. Um, we use AI as a very broad term that covers a whole lot of different sorts of technologies. Um, machine learning is, is, is part of one of those, I suppose. Um, and when we think about community safety, oh, I should preface this by saying this is not going to be a technical five minutes. It's going to be a, a more philosophical five minutes. But we we think about what are the conditions for human flourishing? And when we think about law enforcement and crime, we think of things that get in the way of human flourishing. Um, and we need to resist the kind of drift into technological determinism and models of threats so that we see everything as a threat and the idea is to predict threats. And what we are trying to do is also think of what can we find out using data in in the community that boosts community, um, human flourishing, boosts community independence and, and, and that kind of thing. It's not just a matter of trawling for bad guys, it's also thinking about how can we improve the situation for people. And one of the, the core elements of this is when we're thinking about doing any technological inter intervention, and in particular AI interventions, we need to privilege you know, people. We need to privilege privacy and anonymity and the individual agency of, of people. And I guess that's part of the problem that um, some of the applications of AI in um, particularly the law enforcement sector with perhaps things like predictive policing and some of the face rec stuff um, can be thought of as potentially problematic if it's not, not done um, very well. And there have been lots of widely publicised um, classic failures of AI that don't take this thing, these sorts of things into, into account and, um, and actually treat it as a piece of technology, standalone technology without its broader um, societal implications. And as Ashok was saying, whenever you're dealing with, with you know, people, um, things become very complex very quickly. And so as software developers, um, developing any sort of uh, technological intervention and particularly artificial intelligence, we need to think about um, that broader sociological context and, and how people are, are affected. One of our big themes, and, and this is what we've been talking about, is, is the concept of socio-materiality that you can't divorce technology from its social context. Everything we do has a social context. The, 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 you know, the whole reason that we develop software is to do something for people. So it's, um, 
not really valid to think about a piece of technology in the abstract. You must always think about how it's, how it's um, uh, implemented, how it's developed. Um, and in the case of AI, it's you know, the whole development pipeline from getting your data and making sure your data not only is free of bias, but it's been collected with people's consent um, and actually you know, has a good provenance that we can actually trust that the data itself has been gathered and, and collected and, and managed kind of ethically. Kranzberg, um, 35 years ago, it's, it, you know, it's a good read if you haven't read it, he's Kranzberg's Laws of IT. Um, and his first law is technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. So technology, you can't say it's all good, you can't say it's all bad, but it's never neutral. It's always um, depends on the way you've built it and the way you deploy it and the way it's used. So as you're developing solutions and you know, if we lead back into the GovHack hack thing, when you're thinking about what is the hack we're gonna do, what is the data we're gonna leverage, what is the solution we're gonna to put together, you've got to think about this isn't gonna to, going to um, uh, uh, exist in a vacuum, it's actually gonna you know, go out into the world and manifest in, in all sorts of ways that we, we may not even expect. So you need to do a lot of thought about how is this stuff gonna be used. To do that, you need to understand the data, you understand, need to understand um, where it came from, uh, who created it, what was the mindset of the people that was created, why was it created, why was it presented to you in a certain kind of way. You know, data being part of technology, data is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. Data is never neutral. So you've got to understand what, um, uh, what that's all about. You need to understand the communities that you're, um, you're dealing with. If you're going to build a hack that you know serves a certain community, you need to really kind of get into their heads and figure out what is it that they, they want and what, what could hurt them. Um, and are there other communities that, that may benefit, or there may be there are other communities that may be slightly disadvantaged by the, the work you do? And in this, we've got to really beware secondary effects. Okay, so if you're um, building a piece of software that's um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take the example of you know, face rec might be really you know, effective at, at doing a particular kind of job. It also has secondary effects that people feel surveilled and, and that kind of thing. So you can't just assume that you know, because there's data used in any kind of way and it, it'll only be used in this app will only be used in the way that you think it's going to be used. And finally, focus on the upside. You know, we spend a lot of time trying to think about not only how do we catch the bad guys, but how can we, how can we do positive things in, in the community? How can we use AI and, and the, the data-driven techniques to actually provide some benefits back into security? You know, pumping the upside as well as trying to minimize the, um, the downside. Anyway, that's all I really wanted to say. It's a quick five minutes. That's a condensation of, usually that's a two hour talk. So I think um, it's not, not too bad. I'll now release my screen and um, I'll hand over to Campbell. He's going to talk more about the, the lab. Thank you very much, Craig. That's uh, really helpful. I think, especially, you know, your perspective on how technology, data, all of them have, uh, you know, in in many ways are not neutral, and uh, it, I guess, comes to the to the person who's or, or, or the driver of this or the user of this technology and data, and how do you really make that? empathizing with your community at the same time that this is going to impact. Uh, it's really helpful, uh, Greg, thank you so much. Uh, so for the next uh, uh, phase of the conversation, we're gonna kind of slightly shift gears and, and get a, a, a sense from, from Dr. Campbell, who's joining us in terms of, uh, you know, his focus on, on the Alex lab, which, which uh, both Campbell and Greg are a part of, but also get a sense of what are some of these applications that, uh, you know, Campbell and the team have, have been working on um, and, you know, what are the challenges that they face, some of the things that maybe, you know, they, they're uh, kind of looking for, 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 for solutions to and, and, and uh, you know, uh, in that kind of a perspective. So, again, encourage all of you to share your thoughts, your questions in, in the Q&A bit. Uh, and, you know, we'll, of course, handing over to Campbell in the meantime. Thanks, Eden. And I'll just uh, share my screen. Hopefully you can... 
see something. How's that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to uh, talk a little bit about what this lab, Alex, that we've been uh, alluding to is all about. Um, I'll give you a little really, really brief history of the lab um, and what our main research themes are. And I think that Ashok and Greg have really set the scene well to, um, to, to talk about some of the issues that, um, that are really relevant to this hack. And, and I, can, I can sort of um, expand on some of them as well in terms of the work we're doing. So first of all, um, Alex, the uh, lab that stands for AI for law enforcement and community safety. We pronounce it Alex. There's a lot of different ways that people try to pronounce it. Alex, Ilex, um, supposed to be Alex according to us, but really you can say it any way you want. Um, it's a collaboration between Monash University and the Australian Federal Police. Now I know we've got some uh, New Zealand um, viewers potentially tonight. So just quickly tell you that the Australian Federal Police uh, and for people in Australia as well that may not know is Australia's national policing organization. Um, and they, they deal with complex, serious and transnational crime. Um, they work with uh, obviously the local state police agencies, but they also have a very large network of international um, law enforcement agencies that they work with. Um, given the complex nature of um, some of the investigations that they're involved in. So the Alex Lab is, uh, is a lab that's not been going too long and it's not too big at the moment. <laughs> We're certainly trying to, trying to expand it. So we officially started in July last year, 2019. So we've been going just over a year. Um, it's a three-year co-funded research program between the Australian Federal Police and Monash. And just the, the really brief history is that it grew out of a PhD project. Um, and that PhD project was undertaken by a uh, AFP officer who's still our co-director for the lab. Um, he can't be with us this evening, um, but he did his PhD at Monash on digital forensics. And out of that, um, this uh, this lab grew very organically. Um, the Australian Federal Police were very much interested in continuing um, the work on, on how artificial intelligence and law enforcement can coexist um, and how AI tools can be used um, for broader community safety purposes. Now, a, a primary motivator, um, which was the subject of a lot of the PhD work was um, dealing with a particular crime type, which is a uh, particularly heinous crime um, and is also particularly distressing to all of those, obviously the victims and their families. I'm talking about online child exploitation and the dissemination of um, child sexual abuse material online. Um, so obviously this, this sort of crime is, is, is something that affects um, as I said, victims and their families and, and all involved in the crime terribly, but it also affects um, those tasked with investigating these crimes. Um, and it's an unfortunate fact that over the last few years, the, um, the amount of this material, images, videos, et cetera, um, that is online has increased almost exponentially and, and therefore the load on investigators tasked with um, countering it um, has also similarly increased. And as I guess you could imagine, um, this produces a huge psychological burden on, on those investigators. So one of the primary motivators was to come up with tools um, whereby um, a triage of sorts could be undertaken of this material. So artificial intelligence, um, or machine learning, if we want to use um, perhaps a more specific term, um, allows us to do uh, image classification, not absolutely accurately of this material, but to such a degree that it can um, potentially triage and reduce uh, some of the um, amount of material and prioritize the amount of material that, that needs to be um, encountered by investigators. So that was our primary motivator with the PhD work. 
Since then, um, and as Alex has developed into a, into a full-scale research laboratory, um, we've started to look at a whole range of areas where AI and law enforcement um, can coexist and where AI and machine learning can, can benefit um, law enforcement and community safety more broadly. So our mission really, and I think Greg has touched a bit uh, a bit on this through his uh, discussion around data and around um, the, the fact that um, AI doesn't exist in a vacuum, um, the fact that uh, particularly in law enforcement, um, we're dealing with um, very broad issues of trust for this, this technology. Um, so one of our key mission objectives is that the use of artificial intelligence in law enforcement that we advance should be ethical. Um, and then ethics, of course, is a huge area that we can talk about. It's multidimensional. I hope maybe we can get into some of that discussion um, in the Q&A. Uh, but broadly speaking, we're interested in the ethical use of this technology. Increasing community safety through the development of this technology um, to aid in investigating serious criminal activities. And also, I think really importantly, to realize that because this is such a broad mission, uh, it's not just computer science and information technology that will be tasked with ultimately um, coming up with these, these solutions, that it really does require sociological, criminological, legal perspectives um, to, to be brought to bear on the, on the larger picture here. And, and again, we've, we've touched on that. Um, Ashok mentioned um, in his talk, um, you know, using these tools in a court of law, for instance, um, and as soon as you get to a point where, for instance, uh, the, the, the stakes are very high in the impact of this technology, they're, they're being used to potentially, um, you know, potentially affect people's, uh, people's lives. People are being sentenced potentially based on the outcomes of technological um, solutions. You need to be very clear that you can defend how decisions were made using those tools. This is where explainability comes in, um, various dimensions of ethics, various dimensions of data collection, et cetera, et cetera. So all those different perspectives are really, really important. So just um, to talk quickly about where we're currently targeting our research efforts then in this broader context, um, I, I talked a little bit about the, the initial motivator for the work being um, developing machine learning classifiers for distressing online content. And we're still doing a lot of that, a lot of that work. Um, it's, it's difficult work. Um, it's difficult work, not just because of the data that's involved. Um, it's also difficult because it's a hard task. It's a really hard task. Um, and one of the things that makes it hard in particular is that um, there are different um, jurisdictional um, schema, if you like, um, that mean that training machine learning classifiers is not, is not easy when you move from one place to another because the requirements uh, in terms of what you need to present in a court of law as to how those images may be categorized for, for sentencing purposes, for instance, um, is very hard to translate into something that a machine learning algorithm can, um, can train on and therefore that you can prioritize your triage with. Um, so there's lots of reasons why this is really, really hard, um, but, but we're very interested in accelerating work um, in that area. Um, I've lost my little mouse cursor here, sorry. I've got two screens open here and and it's not letting me advance to the next. Uh, next slide. One second. I think my computer has crashed completely. Yeah, I can't stop it. My whole computer's frozen. 
Uh, I'll have to try and disconnect and come back on, I think. Sorry, can you still hear me? Maybe I... <laughs> I, I, I could continue talking, um, but my computer is completely frozen. Yeah, I'm so like, perhaps just bang through the... Yeah, I'll just, I'll just finish up. I'll just finish up and then I'll try and reconnect. Um, so machine learning, um, our other areas of um, particular interest are explainability. I think this was touched on by both Ashok and, and also a little bit by Greg. So we're interested. <laughs> and I think uh, I think Campbell Campbell has dropped off, yeah. I'm thinking. Um, yeah. So maybe... I, can, I, can, I can continue on a bit. Um, uh, I don't have the slides, but I can, can finish up on. Um, so yeah. there's explainability. So part of the idea is, is about explainability is not, is again, not just how the algorithm works, but um, uh, how the data collection happened, what were the curation pipelines, how was the AI integrated with the rest of digital investigation infrastructure. And in particular, how do you do explainability um, as Ashok said, in, in, in a court. How do you explain to the judge? How do you explain to the legal teams? How do you explain to a jury? Um, and all of this is pretty untested. Um, we're used to technologies like um, DNA testing, and it was took quite um, a number of years between you know, the introduction of the technology and it was accepted as a, as a, as a standard kind of a thing. So there are interesting, really interesting technical issues about, about um, doing explainability, but there's also chronological and, and legal um, and sociological issues about doing that as well. We're also looking at, um, at trying to, you know, um, reduce the problem. So how you do um, scalable uh, near duplicate image detection. So when there's copies of material around, how you actually can tell it's, it's the same photo, you know, it's, you know, been, um, uh, it, it, you know, you've seen this thing before, um, and how how you actually um, uh, how you actually deal with these huge image and video data sets. So there's a infra huge infrastructure problem here as well, um, and how do you do it in a controlled and legal and ethical ethical kind of manner? Um, the sorts of data that we deal with in particularly law enforcement is highly sensitive, so that that gives us um, some really interesting challenges of how you actually work with that um, and make it available in a, in a research context. Um, and, um, and we've also got another a piece of work, which is um, really to do with how do we make different law enforcement data sets uh, actually and, and systems kind of interoperate and, and, and work together. Um, and so that, that's our, our, our sort of core bread and butter at the moment. Um, but uh, and then you've got people like me that are thinking a little bit more on the edge and thinking a bit about the, more about the ethics and the, the privacy and, and surveillance and, the, and how we actually, you know, um, conduct ourselves like that. So I don't know, Campbell, uh, I've banged Sorry, through most, I... <laughs> most of the points on, your, on the slides. Um, do you want to just finish up? No, brilliant. I'm, I'm not sure what you've covered, but I'm sure you covered it really well. Um, <laughs> so, so I guess I would just uh, finish up by echoing um, echoing the issues of, of um, uh, data explainability, data ethics, um, probably finish also by pointing to the fact that um, policing, at least in, um, in Australia and, and um, in a number of countries, um, is really policing by consent. Um, and um, this is often um, referred back to um, as uh, the Peelian principles, which which were, um, I think I think he was a, a an English police commissioner way back last uh, century or maybe the nineteenth century, um, who essentially said that you know um, 
the police are the public and the public are the police and that all policing is by consent and therefore anything um, that erodes that trust that um, partnership with the community is, is um, something that really imperils our society and therefore we want to make sure that um, that trust in these AI algorithms is paramount. I'll just finish on that point. I'm really sorry about the um, I'm not going to try and share my screen again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Campbell. That was uh, really, really insightful. I think we really covered uh, quite a few um, messages there around uh, AI and its applications. Uh, while we were we were chatting, there was also a lot of uh, kind of uh, questions coming uh, through from the from the viewers. Um, so I'll start with the first one from from Brett Cooper, who's um, I guess more of a thought is. One of the biggest issues was when AI ignored issues of sexism, racism, uh, as not condemning the actions and taking a neutral stance, um, which is of course not a healthy response. Uh, would any of you want to take a stab at that one? Uh, I guess I can, I can start. Um, uh, yes, <laughs> um, uh, it's not a healthy response. And so we need to, I mean, so, we need to understand, and, and there's some root causes of that. And part of it was um, an obvious, you know, biases in 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 training data. And we've seen that that sort of um, effect uh, um, in all sorts of applications. Um, and so it really um, it comes from a, a, a sort of uh, you've got to be a bit humble. You need to understand what your data is and what the community is and what you're trying to do. So like what I was saying before, things have to happen. Um, uh, you can't, they can't happen in a vacuum. We were talking about socio-material systems, socio-technology type, type systems. And I think there, there is um, uh, a, a valid you know, sense of sort of outrage and um, a feeling of arrogance when technologists sort of you know, ignore the, the social problems and try and get the technology right. Whereas in fact, the, the, issue, the issue is that we, we do technology for social reasons. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Brett. And um, that's one of the things we're trying to take very seriously um, in, in the lab. As Campbell said, we do this by consent. And you know, if we don't do it well, then we lose consent. So and then that's, that's horrible for all society. So we've got to, we've got to do better. I think, I, I think I'd add to that that these sorts of failures are not technological failures. These are human failures um, because not um, not building systems where um, data sets are inclusive, representative, um, accurate is a human is a human failing. And just uh, saying that we threw terabytes of data at a problem and the technology came up with this um, sexist response. I don't think it's a failure of the technology. I think it's very much a human failure. Thank you very much, Campbell, Craig. Uh, it's a very valid point. Uh, and, you know, a good segue, I guess, to the next question as well, which is more focused this time on national security. Uh, and if you have any visibility into, uh, into your national security for utilities and infrastructure, uh, uh, I mean, do you all have any thoughts on that and, and the role, I guess, AI plays? We don't, we don't directly work in the, uh, the cyber security field too much, although we do have a lot of researchers, um, certainly in the faculty at Monash that we, we interact with that do. Um, I, I mean, there are, there are lots, there are applications of, um, you know, certain, um, I guess certain image classification applications that would be relevant to protecting assets, but we don't we don't have too much direct visibility of, of critical infrastructure systems. Well, we we are we are kind of you know without without sort of getting off track here, we are sort of part of the cybersecurity and systems department within Monash University. We do work with some of these people, mm. and um, I know that. Um, some of the senior cybersecurity people are actually involved in an Asia Pacific um, security forum. And one of the things they are looking at is, is the security around um, uh, 
utilities, particularly in, in, in the Pacific region in, in particular. But like Campbell said, we haven't actually worked directly on that, but I'm sort of professionally aware that, that, that that's happening. Um, and I'm sure that um, uh, we could, um, if we, you know, into that conversation, there'd be, there'd be lots to do. But as Campbell kind of pointed out, um, there's three of us at the moment, and you've seen the list of things we're trying to do. So um, we don't actually need one more just just at the moment. Come and join us, people. Yes, <laughs> yes. Come and help, come and help us do that. Yeah. Thank you so much, folks. Uh, there's another question. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for that quest question. There's another one from her. Uh, what is the relevance of, of facial recognition compared to checking the environmental condition of our depreciating steel infrastructure and optimize the priority of our asset management programs globally? Um, I'm not sure. Hidden. Uh... If any, yeah. Can I take that? Sure. Yeah, sure. Please go for it. Yeah. So, if I understand the question correctly, um, I think, uh, yeah, we cannot say that it is not related to community safety, but at the same time, uh, it may not really be in the area of law enforcement, but more in the area of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the public convenience and uh, the protection of the national infrastructure, etc. I think, uh, say, okay, I think Sarah seems to have used, uh, uh, you know, the term facial recognition. Uh, I think a, a more appropriate term to use there is uh, computer vision, where uh, you can use the AI models to actually see you know, the, the uh, state of a given object, right? In fact, today in manufacturing, already computer vision algorithms are being used to identify a, a defective piece which is manufactured in the in the uh, machine floor uh, so yeah i think the uh -huh. there is certainly relevance of ai in uh, and computer vision algorithms in identifying uh, need for proactive maintenance of national infrastructure it could be steel infrastructure it could be the power lines it could be uh, the the railway track so it could be uh, any uh, thing uh, uh, which is of uh, uh, national importance or uh, importance uh, from a city maintenance perspective. Uh, certainly, AI yeah, can be used, but yeah, uh, we have uh, we've been talking about uh, the uh, community safety and uh, the relevance of usage of AI in uh, law enforcement. Uh, it may not really fall in that area, but it's certainly a very interesting use case to pick up uh, uh, and and try and apply AI uh, to, to achieve this. Thank you very much, Ashok. I think uh, that that uh, really kind of helps um, understand. Uh, I hope Sarah, you 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 also got a, got a good sense of uh, application of computer vision uh, in that case. Um, the next question is uh, again from Brett. So we have uh, uh, quite a few questions from from Brett, which is which is really good. I like the idea of AI monitoring roads to not find bad drivers but identify bad road design, uh, looking at environmental factors like uh, morning evening and sun glare weather factors and the factors that could i guess affect um uh, affect you know the, the, the drivers at this at this stage um yeah well i mean that's that's kind of like what what um i was saying before that that you you know the, you, you can have a, a model of threat perspective of the world you can see the world as threats and risks and that kind of thing or you can see you know the world of, of, of there being issues and using technologies to sort of mitigate some of those those issues without actually you know always leaping towards trying to catch the you know the transgressors of, of, of the rules so i mean there is obviously you know there is a um a crime law enforcement sort of aspect there's also this this other aspect which um we're, we're keen in, in, in mm -hmm. kind of exploring um and as a shock said you know the, the vision can be you know be um we can find people. We could also find potholes in roads, right? So um, there's, it, it really depends on, on you know, um, it, the technology is never neutral. It, it really, you know, a piece of technology can be used for all sorts of different things. And um, and, I, and I, you know, just to you know, um, 
pump it a bit. I mean, that's one of the wonderful things about GovHack is that we can we can think about using technologies in wonderful different ways, um, and not just you know here's some data, let's put it on a dashboard and um, you know draw some graphs. Let's you know think about what are the, some of the interesting ways we can actually use this to do some innovative stuff. Um, that, um, yeah, innovative stuff. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Craig. Uh, can I add? Yeah, sure. Can I add very quickly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I have some, some very, very, very interesting thing to share, especially because uh, Greg mentioned that. Uh, see, we uh, see the question talks about environmental factors like morning sun, evening sun, the glare, the, the, the other weather factors, maybe raining, snowing, etc. Actually, there was a time when uh, we set out to try and model uh, various of these environmental factors, uh, you know, tagging it with the, the geographical location and see if we can try and predict the demand and supply curves in a, for a given particular region. Okay. So, for example, uh, uh, okay, uh, there's a particular season uh, where uh, the, the tornadoes occur in the US. Uh, there is a particular reason when the monsoon uh, wreaks havoc in India, right? There are certain sandstorm or locust uh, storms that happen in, uh, or, or the bushfires that happen in Australia, right? So based on those factors, uh, how do we model the demand and uh, supply that is required for a particular commodity, right? Uh, but yeah, the kind of, the number of features that are there in such a model are enormous, you know, it is, uh, it's really difficult to do the feature engineering to identify the right kind of columns on which you will have to build the model on. And uh, you know, now looking at today's situation, uh, I think we should have really pursued it because we would have uh, uh, probably predicted the demand for the N95 masks in the current situation. We <laughs> made some millions, but yeah. You know, there's a very interesting problem, but it is a very, very hard problem because of the number of variables that are present in mm. the set. Mm. Mm. I'd, I'd also add that building, building AI models of road conditions and weather conditions will be incredibly important for the advent of autonomous vehicles as well, which we expect in the next five or 10 years. Or now, actually, almost. <laughs> Thank you very much, folks. I mean, that is uh, some really interesting thoughts. Um, last is a comment, uh, I guess, before we close the session from, from Sue Ellen. Uh, your, your comments on the, on the need for ethical use of data and AI ML in probably, is probably already covers the concern another competitor has in the recent situation in the US uh, where math mathematicians are boycotting the use of historical data for predictive policing. Um, interesting comment there. I mean, any thoughts? Uh, you know, that's that's a that's a topic for another two-hour lecture. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll just say it comes back to the sorts of things that that um, Brett was asking early on. It's 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 a, a, and what Campbell's saying it's a human human problem. You know, the the data was poor, um, and yet people were uh, using it to do predictive stuff um, where the data really wasn't um, uh, fit for purpose for that. Um, and, you know, there is this, this kind of um, uh, phenomenon where people, you know, if, 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 if an answer comes up on a screen, people will believe it more than if somebody, a human tells them, right? And, um, I guess it's problematic from, from all, all sorts of perspective, but it, it really points back to um, that you really need to understand your data and understand the communities that you're actually deploying the stuff into. And it's a great, great example of, um, uh, of damaging trust between the law enforcement and the communities when you're deploying tools. Because um, in fact, what, what turns out um, is that uh, these things don't predict crime, they actually predict where arrests will happen. And um, because they're using data of arrests, of course, the, the um, efficiency of that algorithm improves because it says, you know, go and do an arrest here and doesn't arrest there. And then it feeds into the data that says, well, you should do another arrest there. Um, and of course, there are racial and, and, and other search-effective biases. So, um, 
but anyway, um, I think we're, we're pretty much at time. So um, I'll stop talking. Uh, you're muted there. I just realized I, I was talking on mute. Uh, but thank you so much, folks. Really appreciate uh, uh, you know, the panel for, for sharing their insights, uh, for the GovHack team for hosting us, and most importantly, for all of you for, uh, for joining us uh, this late in the evening. Uh, for, for we hope uh, an interesting session on, on AI and how it can kind of help you in community safety and law enforcement. Uh, the whole idea for this uh, session was to kind of get you uh, start thinking about, about this theme, about this top topic, uh, you know, it goes without saying that we'll try and align uh, an interesting challenge in this, uh, in this space. So um, that's, uh, that's more or less uh, uh, from us. And, and thank you so much again for, for joining us. We look forward yeah, to thank, it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks again to Eden and Infosys, um, and a special thanks to Dr. Campbell Wilson, uh, Dr. Greg Rowland uh, from Monash University, and Alex Lab, and also to Aisha Ratnagiri from, um, is the Director of Systems Engineering at EdgeFerb, sorry, Aisha. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in tonight and remind you that there are still a couple more events in the lead up to the competition weekend that could give you an edge in our preparation for the competition. Um, tomorrow night, uh, Wednesday the 29th, we've got M4 at Macro Power, to boost any programming language. This is presented by Logan McClintock from the Australian Taxation Office. If you're in Victoria or Queensland, your regional connections event are on Thursday the 30th of July and we'll provide you with information from your regional sponsors. And if you're, if you're in New South Wales, your connections event will be on Friday evening. Check it out on Hackerspace. Um, Friday the 31st of July at 3 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time, we have Exploring Biodiversity Data from CSIRO Open Data. Uh, so don't forget to hop onto Hackerspace, have a look and register now to ensure that you don't miss out on any information that might provide you with the edge uh, in preparation for the competition on the 14th to the 16th of August. Thanks guys and thanks again to the speakers really, really interesting and um, uh, stimulating discussion. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.